now have a look at the gross structure of the lungs, so the anatomy. We'll be looking at the function of certain components of the respiratory tree. We'll be looking at the specialized features of alveoli and their capillaries for rapid gas exchange. And here we're going to actually come back to the whole idea of surface area to volume ratio. We're going to come back to this fixed law of diffusion. It's going to be really interesting here. We're then going to understand the mechanisms of breathing, the role of the diaphragm and intercostal muscles to be it, to bring about these pressure changes, which is therefore going to cause the inspiration expiration of air. OK, then we're going to look at uh, spirometry and we're going to look at what it measures and then be able to read a spirometer trace for the tidal volume, the vital capacity, breathing rate and oxygen consumption. OK, it seems like a lot, but in reality, it really isn't that much if we just break it down into manageable chunks. OK, so first bit, we're going to be looking at the gross structure, function of these components and a little bit about alveoli. And the second part will be looking at the mechanisms of breathing, spirometry and these practical methods in place. As always, I want to show you relevant for your exam board, so AQA. You need to know the gross structure of the human gas exchange system, the essential features of alveolar epithelium, the ventilation exchange of gases, so the whole movement of diaphragm and external intercostal muscles. All right. OCR, the fe features of an efficient gas exchange surface. Again, structures and functions of components of the gas exchange system, the mechanism of ventilation in mammals, and the relationship between vital capacity, tidal volume, breathing rate, and oxygen uptake. And then finally, at Excel, understand how the structure of the mammalian lung is ad adapted for rapid gas exchange. That's very, very broad. It basically encompasses everything. So just in one spec point, it, it encompasses everything. One thing I didn't mention, actually, I'm sorry, that other examples, these are the three major ones, but remember, this is still catered to WJC and the Cambridge International Board as well. It's just the specifications haven't been put in here, but again, it will be very relevant to those boards as well. Okay, so let's have a look at now the structure of the, the lungs. So, um, yeah, sorry, the structure of the lungs. So, lungs are the main, the only gas exchange organs in mammals. Okay, you may have seen a, a picture, a diagram like this in GCSE, but you maybe not, you maybe might not have seen like the kind of uh, differences in intercostal muscles. Um, but everything else I think should be kind of familiar from GCSE. So what we say is that there's a pair of lobed structures. OK, so we've got um, we've got these lungs are lobed. Uh, one lung has three lobes and the other lung has two lobes. Again, you don't need to worry which one is which. You learn that in first year med school. OK, they provide oxygen and remove carbon dioxide from the blood. Of course, they do that because we know, especially from last time we were looking at the heart. So last month we were looking at how the heart pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs, where the CO2 is taken out of the blood, O2 is given to the blood and then returns to the heart via the pulmonary vein. Yeah. And we'll be looking a little bit about the relationship to the heart as well, only briefly though. So let's look at the structure in a bit more detail. So what do the intercostal muscles do? They aid with ventilation and breathing. So they're going to contract and relax. And in by contracting, relaxing, they're actually going to kind of um, cause the lungs to expand or um, or basically deflate based on pressure differences. And I'm going to explain exactly how that happens. Then we have these ribs, OK, and these ribs protect and support the lungs. OK, and the diaphragm, can you see this diaphragm here, which sits under the lungs? This also aids the ventilation and breathing. And again, this can contract and relax to help increase and decrease the uh, volume of the chest cavity, the thorax. And that in turn is going to lead to pressure changes, which is going to allow the lungs to inflate or deflate. And I'll show you exactly how this mechanism occurs later on. 
Okay, so let's look at, so what is this? This is the trachea, okay? And where does it lead from? It leads from, so obviously we have the, no, the nasal cavity in the mouth, the oral cavity. These come together to form the windpipe, the trachea, okay? Now, I need to say, I know a lot of you may already know the difference, but I need to distinguish that this is very different to the esophagus. The esophagus and the trachea actually kind of lie side by side. And... Um, you actually find the esophagus is behind the trachea, okay? Now what happens is if you, that's why if you swallow food and it gets stuck in the trachea, in your windpipe, you're then going to choke, right? Because you can't get enough air coming to, um, coming to the lungs. And also if you don't bite, if you don't chew your food sufficiently and a large chunk goes into the esophagus, what can happen is the esophagus can swell too much and the esophagus swells and that can kind of occlude the trachea that's in front of it. OK, so two reasons why you need to be careful when you're eating food. Make sure you get it down the right way and also make sure you're putting chewing it down enough so that it doesn't actually block up the esophagus. Now, so the trachea is the largest airway. It's the, we say it's the principal airway in which it, um, uh, air moves into once it's entered the nose and mouth. It goes down the trachea. All right. And remember, I used the term respiratory tree. Well, what I want you to do is I want you to follow this path of, uh, let's say, air, inhaled air. So inhaled air is going to come in through the nose and mouth. It's going to go down the trachea. And you see this point, it now splits into two. OK, and it splits into the two bronchi. All right. And here we call these the principal bronchi. So here's the right bronchus and the left bronchus. Why do I say right and left? Because remember, this is flipped. Yeah, the diagram's flipped for us. Because we're looking at a person as if we're facing them. So their left is our right and their right is our left. OK, so left bronchus, right bronchus. And then the bronchus here, this is now you can't see it, but you can see here that the bronchus actually splits into bronchioles, doesn't it? And these bronchioles, so this is all to just increase surface area. All of this is just to increase load surface area. And then if you zoom in even further, you can see this is zoomed in further. You can see that at the end of each bronchial, you see these clusters of air filled sacs. And these are our alveoli. OK, and again, we're going to look exactly at what each single alveolus, alveolus looks like and what is the purpose of it, OK? So brief recap, air moves down the trachea, goes through each of the bronchi, splits into the bronchioles and at the ends of each bronchioles, you'll see these alveoli. Now, where does major where does pretty much all of the gas exchange occur? It all occurs at the alveoli, OK? And why is that? Because the alveoli are they're very well adapted and we're going to have a look at a few of these adaptations. So here there's a few of them already mentioned that it's surrounded by capillaries. We'll see why it's important that there's a good blood supply next to the alveoli. And also there are only one cell thick walls. And again, some of you might be relaying this back to fixed law of diffusion. And if it's only one cell thick walls, it's probably telling you something about a decreased width of the exchange surface, meaning that it's probably going to increase the rate of diffusion. But I'll spell it out in a minute. OK. Now, so I've showed you the different parts of the respiratory tree. Very simple. Trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, alveoli. OK, four parts. Now, within these four parts of the respiratory tree, we actually have these components throughout it. And what these components are there to do is there to kind of control air movement. All right. So firstly, elastic fibers, they aid in breathing out. OK, now what I want you to think about, it's in the name elastic fibers. I know we talked a little bit about it in um, biological molecules. We looked at elast elastin being a protein. We then looked at it again in cardiology, the cardiovascular system last month where we were looking at in the uh, blood vessels. Remember in the tunica media, we have these elastic fibers for helping with uh, maintaining a uh, constant blood pressure but in the role in the uh, context of gas exchange in our respiratory tree why does it aid in breathing out well imagine as air flows into the trachea bronchi bronchioles and as it inflates the alveoli which are like our gas sacs yeah as it inflates the gas sacs when we breathe out imagine these alveoli having loads of elastic fibers they can they, they are stretched these fibers are stretched when 
air flows into it. And as soon as you're trying to breathe out, the elastic fibers recoil. So they go back to their original shape, which doing so forces air out and upwards. OK, because remember, you're going against gravity. All right. So it's a, a nice little mechanism in place to ensure that as much air gets squeezed out of the alveolar sacs up through the bronchioles through the bronchi up out the trachea okay so this the stretching when breathing in and the recoiling of these fibers helps to push air out again it's pretty easy to visualize but again i'll see if there's any questions in a minute what's the next component the next component is smooth muscle now what does this do this controls the diameter of the airways OK, so when you exercise, the smooth muscle relaxes, making the airways wider, allowing for greater airflow. So what I want to do is I just want to show you, let's say we're looking at a cross sectional area. So let's look at let's say this is the bronchus, one of the let's say it's the left bronchus, for example. We're going to have the lumen, OK, just like we did in blood vessels, we're going to have a lumen of this. So let's say we have a small lumen here. Let's say, so what we're saying here is that the smooth muscle is contracted, meaning that it's made this airway, the, the lumen is now uh, smaller. Do you think that air is going to flow more or less through it? Well, obviously it's going to throw, it's going to flow less because there's more uh, friction, there's more air resistance, there's not enough, um, there, there's a smaller uh, area for air to flow through. Compare this to, for example, one with a bigger lumen. Here, more air can flow per unit time, meaning that there's going to be a greater movement of air. Now, you might be wondering, OK, that's cool and all, but why do we need to do that? Well, remember, if we're trying to breathe harder and faster, we want to dilate these airways. We want them to be as big as possible to allow as much air to enter our alveoli as possible. But if we're just in rest, OK, we, we can probably relax our smooth muscle because right now I'm talking. I'm probably having to take a breath every few seconds just to be able to carry on. But for you guys at home, you're not talking, you're just breathing. You're it's a normal uh, ventilatory rate, meaning that there's not as much demand for oxygen. And so the smooth muscle can be nice and relaxed, uh, sorry, uh, contracted, meaning that the airways are much more um, um, the airways are much more um, smaller, basically. There's a there's a uh, much narrower. That's the word. So when I'm because I'm breathing more, um, I I need the smooth muscle to relax to make the airways wider. But for you guys at home, you're just listening. There isn't much uh, metabolic activity going on, and therefore your smooth muscle contracts to make the airways narrower. OK, and this is just ensuring maximum efficiency of we don't want to be breathing in too much air when we don't need to. And in the same way, when we are exercising, when there's a high metabolic activity, we don't want the smooth muscle to be um, uh, contracted, restricting our airflow. We want the maximum amount of airflow as possible. OK, and again, uh, we'll look at where these are situated. So elastic fibers, smooth muscle and finally cartilage. Cartilage, this provides support and prevents the trachea and bronchi from collapsing when pressure drop when pressure drops from breathing in. So what do we mean by that? Well, we know that when we when we breathe out, OK, there's all of this high pressure as the elastic fibers recoil. The air is literally forced out of us. OK, like I want you to just think, just do, take a deep breath in. And then like quickly breathe out. It's a high pressure. You could feel that if you put your hand in front of your mouth. You can feel that pressure literally as you breathe out. OK, so there's a high pressure, meaning that the trachea is under immense pressure, meaning it's going to stay open. OK, but when you're breathing in, what happens is that there isn't going to be as much pressure. OK, so if you breathe in. You can't feel that much pressure. If you put your hand in front of your mouth, you can't feel that much pressure. And that too, the air does not actually, there's not much pressure going through the trachea, meaning that because there's a lack of pressure in the trachea, the trachea could collapse inwards if it didn't have what we call these rings of cartilage. OK, I'm going to show you what this looks like. But in a diagram, usually they show it like this, where it's like rings of cartilage that help keep it open. 
So you can see it's like a scaffolding of the trachea and that's in place to keep it open at all times. But mainly when you're breathing in, there's a pressure drop. And therefore, if there's no pressure, if there's no pressure acting from within, because usually pressure acts from within to keep it open. But when you're breathing in, if there's no pressure, then it's likely if I did it, if I had a trachea without the rings of cartilage, the atmospheric, the pressure inside the um, uh, so the pressure inside the trachea would be lower than the pressure outside the trachea and therefore it would collapse inwards. Yeah, but by having uh, pressure going in through um, when you're breathing out, by having high pressure when you're breathing out, it means that you're not going to suffer this pressure drop and therefore it's going to stay open. But when you're breathing in, you need these rings of cartilage. OK, so having these, these rings of cartilage is imperative for providing support and preventing the trachea from collapsing in on itself. OK. Um, all right, I think. Yeah, all right, let's just carry on. I'll, I'll take questions in a minute. So those are the three uh, main kind of structural and uh, me 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 mechanistical kind of uh, components. But now let's also look at some of the cells that are involved. OK, so it's not only do we have these elastic fibers, smooth muscle and rings of cartilage or just cartilage, but we also have two specialized types of cells. We have goblet cells, OK, and these are. Can you see this here? This is a goblet cell. And you can see that these are kind of interspersed in between these cilia cells. So this is a cilia cell and this is a goblet cell. So first, I want you to note the structure of this goblet cell. It's firstly slightly smaller than a cilia cell, and that's because the cilia cells have all of these hair like projections, OK, whereas a goblet cell does not have it. So what does the goblet cell do? It secretes mucus to trap dirt and microorganisms. And especially microorganisms like pathogens, right? And again, we'll have a look at this in uh, the immune system. You'll see how this links in mucus uh, being one of the primary defenses, all of these mucus secreting cells. So where do we get mucus? We get mucus in the nose, we get earwax in the ears. These are all kind of parts of our primary defense system. But even within our respiratory tree, we can secrete mucus. Ever, have you ever had a phlegmy throat before? That's probably because when you have an infection, there's loads of pathogens and your body is trying to your goblet cells within your respiratory tree are trying to secrete loads of mucus to try to stick those pathogens together to be and then what happens you might think okay they're all stuck together where does it go from there well all this dirt and microorganisms they get stuck in the mucus and then the cilia cells because they have these hair like uh, projections they kind of waft the mucus up they waft the mucus upwards and out of the lungs, okay? And so it wafts it wafts it upwards towards the mouth, okay? And then once it reaches the mouth, we can re-swallow it. So either usually you can spit the uh, phlegm out, um, the mucus out, or if you re-swallow it, remember once it reaches the stomach, there's uh, what's the pH of stomach acid too, right? It's got all these proteases, mean they're pepsin, and that is going to break down the, the proteins in the microorganisms and therefore the pathogen is going to die anyway. So the goblet cells, they don't only secrete mucus just to trap dirt, but also they play a big role in our immune defense system. OK, and we'll talk a, a lot about that in a future lesson where we look at the immune system. So yeah, to stop them from reaching the alveoli and prevents lung infection. Now, the cilia cells, we already said, they kind of waft the um, mucus up and out of the lungs to the throat, where we can then re-swallow or spit out the mucus either way, but it just ensures that it doesn't reach the alveoli where it could cause a lung infection. So they work side by side. I, I hope that's clear for you guys. Now, the last thing to do is to kind of see, all right, I've explained the different components, but Ravi, you haven't told me where these components are. So let me tell you precisely where each component is located within our respiratory tree. All right. So first, let's look at the trachea. OK, so the trachea, which is our windpipe. Let's see what is found. So and I want you guys, you might think I'm just showing you this diagram for fun. Well, not really, because what you will see maybe um, in your practicals, uh, you may have heard of something called required practicals or PAGs. Uh, or the you know your practical endorsement in that you're required to actually look at things under the microscope you're required to do certain practicals and not only do you need it for your practical endorsement but you also need it for your 
uh, your papers, your A-level papers, because I think the statistic is that overall 30% is about um, practicals and math skills. So I think 15% is math skills. So I think 15 to 20% is about practicals, all right? And what comes under practicals is histology. And so I really need you to be able to identify things by looking at a histological diagram. And so what we've done here is we've designed these diagrams to bait Obviously, they won't be coloured under a microscope, but this is a nice way to show you what's actually found. So in the trachea and the windpipe, can you see? Firstly, I want to point out this C, uh, this C-shaped ring of cartilage. Can you see that? Now, you're going to have loads of these throughout the entire trachea. You're going to have one ring, another ring, another ring, another ring. And these, again, remind yourself what they're for. It's to provide support and to ensure that when you're breathing in, when the pressure drops, the trachea don't collapse in on themselves, but they're actually held open, yeah? Another way you might like to think about it, I don't know if anyone's fam familiar with stents, but um, if you have coronary artery disease, they usually put in a stent to ensure that the vessel stays open. You could think of it in the same way, the, cart the rings of cartilage to ensure that it stays open. The next bit, we were talking about elastic fibres. You can see there's in yellow, we've got the elastic fibres here. We've then got the smooth muscle and the smooth muscle helps to contract or um, relax. And that will either, when it's contracted, it's going to narrow the airways. And when it relaxes, it's going to widen the airways, okay? And then we're going to have um, our ciliated epithelium. And in that, you're going to have cilia cells and goblet cells. Now, one thing that wasn't really clear from the other, other diagram, which I really do want to emphasize, is what is the ratio of cilia cells to goblet cells? Now, this is just a bonus. I highly doubt they're going to ask you this, but I just want to show you anyway. So let's say these are two cilia cells. Let's throw in a little goblet cell as well. And then we'll put some more cilia cells. And then another goblet cell. So can you see every four, every four to five cilia, cilia cells, you probably get a goblet cell. OK, so they may ask you about the ratio in terms of like which which prevails more. You have more goblet cells than, as you have more cilia cells than goblet cells in the respiratory tree. And that's because you don't want to over secrete too much mucus, right? So it, the, the key thing here is make some mucus and then have loads of cilia cells to be able to waft it because they need to work together to waft the mucus upwards to the mouth. Yeah. So I just wanted to make it clear that it's not because it's in the other diagram, this diagram here, it kind of looked like it was a one cilia cell, then one goblet, then one cilia, then one goblet. I just want to kind of reiterate the fact that it's not actually like that. It's actually multiple cilia cells, then a goblet cell, then probably another four or five cilia cells then. Yeah. OK, now let's do the same thing with a bronchus. So remember, bronchi are the, so the trachea and then it splits into the two bronchi. So let's have a look here again. You're, now you're going to have small pieces of cartilage. But they're not they're not rings of complete cartilage. They're kind of cartilage and then smooth muscle, cartilage, smooth muscle, cartilage, smooth muscle. Yeah. And again, we know what the smooth muscle does. It contracts to narrow the um, airways and it relaxes to widen the airways. Yeah. Again, elastic fibers to stretch and recoil to allow the uh, air to move upwards. Um, and then, yeah, that's it. So you can see it's basically the same stuff, but you just kind of need to kind of learn the arrangement, be able to recognize if they don't label any of this, they don't tell you it's the bronchi. You should be able to just by looking at a diagram like this, tell us that this is the bronchus. Yeah. Then we've got bronchioles. So now you can get differences and this is where it becomes slightly different. So you can get a large versus medium versus small bronchial. In the large bronchioles, you have everything apart from cartilage, right? In the medium bronchioles, you have everything except goblet cells and cartilage. And in the small bronchioles, you have nothing apart from elastic fibers. OK. Now, that's very important because you want to see how do like, the how do the components um, reduce the number in the large bronchioles, which have just come out. Let's so you think of the principal bronchi. They now. So let's let's draw it here. We've got the trachea splits into the bronchi. Right. Then you have the bronch uh, a large bronchial so might split into a smaller bronchial. And even from here, you might get an even smaller bronchial. 
Yeah. So you, you, we want to be able to see what the differences are. So it's a large, medium, small bronchial. So in the large bronchial, like I said, no cartilage. So none of the bronchioles have cartilage. Um, in the medium bronchial, by, by the time you reach there, there's no goblet cells. And by the time you reach the small bronchial, there is nothing apart from elastic fibers. And again, you can see that here, smooth muscle elastic fibers, no cartilage, the, room, the cartilage was in gray, and you've got the ciliated epithelium with some goblet cells, but once you reach medium and small, you're not going to have any goblet cells, okay? And finally, the alveoli, which again, this is not the only diagram, we're gonna look at a much more in-depth diagram, and we're gonna be looking at, okay, what does alveoli have? Well, it has nothing apart from elastic fibers. And this is really important because we want to maximize the space for uh, gas to be um, in this sac. And also, remember, because these are one cell thick, we don't want too much in there to make it thicker because this is the, the main uh, thing for gas exchange. And I like to think of the alveoli specialized just like um, capillaries. Remember, capillaries we looked at last month, they are one cell thick again. The endothelium is one cell thick. And they don't have any of this smooth muscle and elastic fibers and all that kind of stuff. But, and, sorry, not um, they don't have any smooth muscle and um, uh, collagen or anything for structural support because we don't want to make it any thicker. We want it to keep it nice and thin to ensure that there's maximum exchange of nutrients. And in the same way here, we want to keep it very thin to ensure maximum exchange of gas. Yeah. But anyway, let's we'll look at um, some um, the adaptations of alveoli. But note that there's a capillary that kind of surrounds itself, and this is a very important. We'll look at why does it need to have a very good blood supply. Okay, now as a nice little summary. Again, when you get a copy of these slides, this will be really useful. I would literally copy and paste this into your notes. This is actually one of the best things to kind of consolidate because. Um, and what you'll see is that this could be a typical six marker. I remember when I was doing my mock in year 12, we had a six marker on explain the components and differences and compare and contrast the components in different parts of the respiratory tree. There's a lot to talk about and you have to not only tell, tell the examiner the location of them, but what each of them are used for. So what is the elastic fibers responsible for? What is smooth muscle responsible for? So it could actually be even a nine marker, right? And um, <clears throat> those of you that do AQA, um, I want to remind you guys that even in, in the last paper, you have that 25 mark essay. This could again be a really nice uh, example of an essay question where they could talk about explain the ways in which um, the gas exchange system is adapted to allow for efficient gas exchange in humans, for example. You could talk about all about fixed law. You can talk all about the different parts of the respiratory tree and all the components. And then finally, you could talk about. Um, no, that's all you need to talk about. You don't need to go into the mechanisms of breathing, but that is a lot to talk about for 25 markers. So that could be quite good. <coughs> Sorry. So, um, right, so let's have a look at, so now that we've identified the different structures and we kind of looked at the kind of anatomy and histology of it, now let's actually dive deep into what's going on in terms of gas exchange. So this is quite, quite a mad diagram. So what's going on here? We've got ventilation maintaining diffusion gradients. What does this mean? By ventilating the alveoli, it means that air, freshly oxygenated air is entering the alveoli. That's why you can see red is coming in and that that's leading to a buildup of these oxygenated or a buildup of o2 here and you can see these blue represent co2 leaving okay now that's happening with air entering the alveoli because obviously we breathe in air it goes through our oral um oral and nasal cavity goes down the trachea bronchi bronchioles alveoli and enters now what's happening here though <clears throat> Why did I say we need this rich blood supply? Because remember, in the blood, and these are capillaries, okay? These are capillaries that have anastomose coming from the uh, aorta, isn't it? So, <clears throat> no, sorry, not aorta. It's coming from the um, deoxygenated, yeah, deoxygenated, bl deoxygenated blood coming from the pulmonary artery. And here, this is oxygenated blood that then leaves to go uh, via the pulmonary vein to go to <clears throat> to go to the heart yeah so 
what's happening here, this this kind of illustrates the anastomosis, where it's the joining of capillaries, both from the pulmonary artery and from the pulmonary vein. And so what happens is that we've got deoxygenated blood coming in from the pulmonary artery, because remember the pulmonary artery comes from the right, <clears throat> right ventricle to go to the pulmonary artery, and then the deoxygenated blood goes into the capillaries that surround the alveoli. Now, if we have all this deoxidated blood, can you see that there's a, a nice steep diffusion gradient whereby you've got loads of CO2 here, very little CO2 here, and loads of O2 here, sorry, loads of O2 here, and very little O2 here, meaning that there's going to be a net movement of oxygen molecules into the blood and a net movement of CO2 out of the blood into the alveoli, which is great because that means that we're going to be able to use all that oxygen from the alveolus, put it into the blood and get rid of all that waste CO2 that we want to then breathe out. Yeah. And you can see you can then track the path of it. And then you now, by the time you get towards the pulmonary vein, you've now got all this oxygenated blood that can go re-enter the heart via the left atrium. And then it can go down into the left ventricle, come up through the aorta, and then it can send out all this nicely, freshly oxygenated blood to all parts of the body. OK, <clears throat> but what I really want to kind of highlight here is the need for this uh, rich blood supply via the capillaries to ensure there's a steep concentration gradient. OK, and what, what am I saying concentration of? Concentration of CO2 and O2. There needs to be a steep concentration. If there was loads of O2 here, and loads of O2, there isn't going to be any movement, is there? You need where there's loads of O2 and very little O2 here, that's going to cause the net movement of O2 into the blood. OK, so it's all about concentration gradients. And those of you that are now always thinking back to fixed law, you'll remember. Do you remember the difference in concentrations was on the numerator of fixed law, meaning that rate of diffusion is directly proportional to um, difference in concentration. So if there's an increased difference in concentration, there's going to be increased diffusion. Yeah. So that's why we have this blood supply that has <clears throat> that maintains a steep concentration difference which allows maximal rate of diffusion all right so i i assume i feel like we're going to go through all these ad adaptations now so let's have a look at what's going on here well alveoli they have a large surface area now you're probably thinking mm, hang on we you said that these alveoli are small little sacs little gas sacs so how can they have a large surface area <clears throat> Well, these alveoli, OK, individually, they're very small, OK, granted. However, they are very small, meaning they have a large surface area to volume ratio. Fine, but that's only one alveolus. We have millions of alveoli in our lungs, loads of them, OK? So therefore, the combined surface area to volume ratio is now significantly increased. Let's say, for the example, we were using that one by one by one cube, Let's say we have a surface area to volume ratio for each alveolus of six. Yeah, six to one. Now, if we have a million of them, we've now got six million. Um, <coughs> um, six million times the surface area to volume ratio. Yeah, therefore, we've got a very, very, very large surface area, making it a brilliant um, gas exchange surface. OK. We then also have moist walls. Now, <clears throat> moist walls helps with the concentration gradient. OK, it helps with uh, increasing diffusion, the rate of diffusion. Permeable walls. Well, of course, the walls need to be permeable. If they're impermeable, how are the gases going to be able to move in and out? Yeah, so it needs there needs to be some permeability there, just like we looked at. Do you remember last month I was talking about the capillaries? They have fenestrations coming from the French word fenêtre for window. So in the same way, alveoli have their own uh, little gaps and these allow for uh, movement, yeah? Now we said they're one cell thick walls and I already talked about that in fixed law. We say that a decreased width would mean that there's a greater rate of diffusion. And so by already having a one cell thick wall, that is makes it a brilliant gas exchange surface. Extensive blood supply. Well, I already mentioned we need this extensive blood supply to maintain that steep concentration gradient between O2 and also CO2 as well. And finally, the large diffusion gradient 
this not only comes about by this blood supply removing CO2 and O2 to ensure that there's always this concentration difference, but also we need ventilation to maintain this diffusion gradient. If we stop breathing, or and you'll see when we look at some respiratory diseases, if for, if for whatever reason the blood supply is working fine, but our ventilation is not working, we're not able to get in is enough oxygen and get out enough CO2, that's going to lead to a smaller diffusion gradient and therefore you're not going to get as much gas exchange as you would want. OK, so hopefully you can see how all of these are coming into play now and you can see how things are starting to link together better. So to summarize this first part, the lungs are a specialized organ for gas exchange. They consist of a series of windpipes that get smaller and smaller and end in these air sacs called alveoli. It goes from tra trachea to bronchi to bronchiole to alveolus. So, sorry, these are singular, so this should be bronchus actually. Yeah, so trachea to a bronchus or the two bronchi to then bron bronchioles and then the alveoli. OK. We have the trachea being supported by these C-shaped rings of cartilage. And again, remind yourself this is to ensure that the trachea does not collapse in on itself, especially during breathing in when pressure inside the trachea is less than the pressure outside the trachea. The bronchi are also supported by smaller bits of cartilage. Specialized cells called goblet cells end up producing the mucus and they line the trachea and bronchi. And the goblet cells, when they produce the mucus, is trapped with dirt and pathogens and other microorganisms. And then we have the ciliated epithelial cells, which waft the mucus. So we always say move, but I prefer the word waft actually. So they just waft the mucus up and out of the lungs. And finally, gas exchange happens in the alveoli and they are very well adapted for gas exchange, as seen before. So let's have a look at this question here, question 7a. Name the air sacs and state why there are many air sacs in the lungs. OK, <clears throat> so name the air sacs is easy, alveoli. And why are there many air sacs in the lungs? Well, remember what I said that each air sac right, is quite small. It does have a large surface area to volume ratio, but in order to be able to achieve maximum uh, gas exchange, maximum efficiency of gas exchange, let's just duplicate this. So we've, we've found something that works. Let's just make loads of them. And if we have loads of them, it means it could the gas exchange can be increased many times over. Yeah. So we've got alveoli and it provides a much larger surface area. OK, very simple. Two marks. <coughs> Name the type of epithelium in the walls of the air sac. So actually, I did mention this. So someone was asking about what does epithelium actually mean? So epithelium is literally a, a cell layer made of one type of cell or multiple different types. So it doesn't matter. But so when we look at the ciliated epithelium that consisted of cilia cells, the hair like cells with goblet cells interspersed here, the answer for this one is squamous cells. Now, just so that you guys kind of know what, what what this means, squamous cells kind of look like this, okay? They have a little bulge in the middle where you have the nucleus in it and they're flattened cells, right? So let me draw another one so you can kind of see how it looks. There's a little bulge comes under, a little bulge like that again, okay? And I'll do one more. I would urge that you actually look at an actual drawing because my drawings aren't the best, but. So you, can, you get the idea. These are flattened sacs, <coughs> so flattened cells and they contain a nucleus. And yeah, these are this is squamous cells. You can imagine if we curve this round, we make it into a circle. This is essentially what the cell membrane of the um, alveolus is, the squamous epithelium. Um, the air sacs contain many elastic fibers. Explain the role of these. Again, very easy to marks. We need to think about what do elastic fibers do? They stretch when you breathe in. And then when you breathe out, they help in the breathing out by recoiling. To kind of when they recoil, they force all that air out. OK. So, oh, and another thing yet yeah, to prevent bursting. So when if the if there were no elastic fibers, as you can imagine, if it if it has a fixed shape, as air pressure builds in, as air enters, yeah, 
air can only go if it's allowed to stretch, right? Like it needs to accommodate the increase in air, yeah, the increase in volume. So it's to prevent bursting, but also to recoil, to go back to, to put the, make the air sac go back to its original size to help force air out. OK, and remember, because you're going against gravity, you're trying to move all that air upwards out of your mouth, out of your nose, and therefore it needs this extra boost, which comes from the recoiling of these elastic fibers. OK, so for efficient gas exchange to occur, a steep diffusion gradient must be maintained between the air in the air sacs and the blood. OK, a steep diffusion gradient can be maintained by ventilating the lungs. This refreshes the air in the air sacs. Explain how refreshing the air in the air sacs actually helps to maintain a steep diffusion gradient. Well, we already did talk about this, but if we're able to move the O2, uh, sorry, uh, remove the CO2 from the air sacs, it means that more CO2 from the blood can actually diffuse into the alveolus, right? Because there's not a buildup of CO2 there. And by moving more O2 into the alveolus, it means more oxygen can enter the blood supply, right? So it increases the partial pressure of oxygen or the concentration of oxygen in the air sac. Therefore, the concentration of oxygen is higher than in the blood supply. That then allows this steep concentration gradient of oxygen moving into the blood supply. And in the same way, it decreases the concentration of carbon dioxide in the sac as we, move, we breathe it out, so it's removed from the alveoli. And therefore, the CO2 in the alveolus is lower than in the blood, so blood can then move its CO2 to the um, alveolus. Yeah. So it's all it's all very interesting. It's all very logical as well. If you just think about the gradients and what's happening, where a particle is going to move, you can kind of build a picture in your head of what's happening. Describe and explain one other way in which a steep diffusion gradient is maintained in the lungs. So here we're going to talk about blood supply, aren't we? So we're going to say that continuous blood flow in the capillaries to bring more carbon dioxide to the alveoli and take away more oxygen from the alveolus, right? Or you can also talk about oxygen combining with hemoglobin, and we talked a lot about that last month. Hemoglobin being that globular protein uh, for subunits. And um, yeah, what does it do? It combines with oxygen at partial pressures of um, high partial pressures of oxygen. And then it takes it to areas of low partial pressure of oxygen namely metabolically active cells, so respiring cells, and it's going to offload the oxygen there. And by, by combining the hemoglobin with oxygen, we're able to then keep the concentration in the blood actually quite low, and therefore more oxygen can diffuse from the alveolus into the blood. This is a bit niche. I would actually, personally, if I was going to write a two mark answer, this would be my one, okay? Uh, this is correct, but it's a bit of a roundabout way of getting the same thing. This is the best one to say that a continuous flow of blood. You're just instantly taking the blood, oxygenated blood away, and you're bringing more carbon dioxide blood to the alveolus, and then you're going to have exchange of gas. Oxygen comes into the blood, and then you take it away. It's an ongoing system. OK. Right, 12A. The lungs in a mammal are adapted for efficient gas exchange. The diagram below illustrates a small part of the lung responsible for gas exchange. All right, so this is a nice little 3D diagram here. So we've got, we can see, what do we have? We have the bronchioles splitting into, uh, into the gas sacs. We have blood flow coming in, okay? So remember, this is deoxygen. So here, we need to identify what kind of blood is this. This is deoxygenated blood coming in, right? Because when blood enters, near the alveoli, it's going to be deoxidated blood that's ready to accept oxygen. OK, and therefore blood that comes out of this capillary anastomosis, this capillary network, this blood is going to be oxygenated, right? So this is oxygenated blood. All right, so let's look at this question now. So on the diagram, add a line labeled P to a branch of the pulmonary vein. So here you need to now think about going back to last lesson, last month, we were looking at, OK, what is the difference between the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein? Um, <clears throat> just for simplicity, I'm going to draw the heart as four, four squares, OK? Four chambers. Right, what is this? This is the right atrium, left atrium, uh, 
left ventricle and right ventricle. All right. What comes into the right atrium? This is the vena cava. Uh, enters here. What comes out of the right ventricle? This is the pulmonary artery. All right. Don't worry, I'm going to talk about all the passages of blood, so don't worry too much. I'm going to go over it. What comes into the left atrium? It's the pulmonary vein. And what comes out of the left ventricle it is the aorta. OK. Now let's track the passage of blood. So we should know this is a very small recap over the last month's session. OK, so deoxygenated blood enters the right atrium, which goes through the atrioventricular valve to enter the right ventricle. And then the deoxygenated blood goes through the pulmonary artery to enter to go to the lungs, isn't it? So just by this, we know that this um this must be the pulmonary artery isn't it because it's deoxidated blood going to the lungs so we know that this is the pulmonary artery now i know it doesn't ask you to identify the pulmonary artery but i just want to do it for for your clarity but what do they ask us to find they ask us to find the pulmonary vein or a branch of the pulmonary vein so let's look so pulmonary vein Remember, pulmonary vein brings oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium of the heart, which will go through the uh, um, atrioventricular valve to get to the uh, left ventricle. And then oxygenated blood then makes its way into the aorta to then be sent to all parts of the body where, it, where the oxygen can be used up. So pulmonary vein is blood that is leaving the lungs. So it must be this, isn't it? This must be a branch of the pulmonary vein. So there's a line and we're going to label it P to show that it's a branch of the pulmonary vein. All right. Now, in reality, if I was doing the exam, obviously I wouldn't draw all this out, but for your understanding, I hope you really are able to put these things together. You do need to like know this. And again, it was a very simple diagram. It took me about a minute to draw, but if you ever forget, do something like this. Put a little diagram on the side of your paper, rub it out at the end if you want to, okay, do it in pencil. But this way you won't make any mistakes. It's very important you know what's going in and out. Now, again, some of you, you may you might recall if you just look at this question here, sorry. Um, it even tells you which one's deoxidated oxygen. So you can even kind of just remember which way it goes. But I feel like, can you see they've changed the direction here? This is deoxidated going from right to left, whereas in this one, it's going from left to right. Yeah, left coming out, so left going to right, basically. So it's you, you can get easily confused, and therefore I think it's better to learn it from first principle. Yeah, right. Give one difference between the structure of a capillary and the structure of a vein. Right. So again, this is not really much to do with uh, gas exchange, but we touched on this last session. So a capillary and a vein. Well, capillaries, firstly, they are much smaller. They have they're single cell thick. Their their endothelium is one cell thick. Um, and they don't have any valves, whereas the vein um, is thicker and it has valves as well. OK, but it only says one difference. So capillary wall is one cell thick while vein wall is thicker. Uh, capillary has no collagen for structural support, but, and whereas veins do. Capillaries don't have valves, but veins do. And capillaries have a smaller lumen in capillary. Yeah, capillaries have smaller lumen than veins. OK, but I think the most obvious one was capillaries don't have valves and capillary walls only one cell thick. All right, but you only need one of them anyway. OK. All right, so the diagram below represents the approximate concentrations of oxygen and carbon dioxide inside an alveolus and a capillary in the lungs. These gases will diffuse at different rates. And using the information in the diagram, explain the difference in the rate of diffusion of these gases. Right, so when I look at this diagram, um, I already know from my background knowledge that I know oxygen is going to go from alveolus to capillary. OK, that's the whole point of the lungs, that we need more oxygen in the alveolus and the capillary. But I'm looking at this and I'm seeing that I need to explain the difference in the rate of diffusion using information in the diagram. Keywords again. Remember, I said that in exam questions, I'll always highlight the stuff you need to pay attention to. Now, what information is provided to me in this diagram? Well, what I can see here is that they've given me some percentages all right and these percentages represent the approximate concentration of oxygen and carbon dioxide inside an alveolus and capillary 
All right. So what I can see here is that there's 15 percent oxygen, 8 percent oxygen. So I'm just going to do a quick difference. I'm going to do 15 minus 8 equals 7 percent difference. OK. And carbon dioxide, 5 and 7. So I'm just going to do 7 minus 5. That gives me there's a 2 percent difference. OK. So I need to explain the rate difference in the rate. of So out of these, which one do you think is going to have a faster rate of diffusion? Well, going back to the whole idea of difference in concentration, fixed law, the greater the difference in concentration, the greater the rate of diffusion, right? So this is exactly testing your fixed law of diffusion. So because oxygen has a greater difference, we can expect that it's going to diffuse more quickly than CO2, yeah? So oxygen diffuses more quickly than CO2 because they have different concentration gradients. I would do one step more than this. I would actually calculate them and say that oxygen has a 7% difference, whereas CO2 only has a 2% difference. And then, um, OK, it's talking about molecules being different sizes. That's true. The carbon dioxide and oxygen molecules, they are different sizes. Um, if I had to think about the size, if you think about oxygen has a uh, molecular mass of 16, so oxygen molecule O2 would have a molecular mass of 32, CO2 would be 32 plus 12, 40. so carbon dioxide would have a bigger, is a bigger molecule than oxygen. Um, therefore, as in, I, I don't see the need to really talk about molecules being different sizes in terms of the rate of diffusion, but I suspect a bigger molecule will be, will take longer to diffuse through because it's bigger, it weighs more, and therefore it will take longer. But I think the main points that I would talk about is this here. Yeah, The fact that there's a different concentration gradient calculated here, and therefore you can make the assumption that oxygen will diffuse more quickly. But I hope you also understand why they're saying this point, because the mass of O2, sorry, equals 32, and the mass of CO2, equals 44. Right, and therefore because it's heavier, it's probably going to have a lower rate of diffusion. All right, part C. Now this is explicitly um, and someone asked me, do, will they give you the formula? So here you can see in this question, I did say that some questions they will, I think they probably will give you the equation. You might you may not be expected to know, but again, just double check your specification if this is one of the equations that you're expected to know. There will be like a expected formula thing where you're expected to know certain formulae. So fixed law of diffusion states that the rate of diffusion is proportional to the surface area, the difference in concentration and the length of the diffusion pathway. So this is the formula using information given the question you're only explaining how rapid gas exchange takes place in a mammal. OK. Right, we've touched on this a lot, so I'm just going to put up the marking points here. So the idea that a large surface area is provided by alveoli, which is obviously increased surface area leads to increased rate of diffusion. Uh, a large surface area is provided by this large capillary network. If you've got loads of capillaries, there's more points of uh, where oxygen can diffuse from the capillary to the alveolus. The idea that the concentration gradient is maintained by ventilation as well as circulation. Yeah, so ventilation causes uh, more oxygen to enter the alveolus and more CO2 to leave. And a blood, the good blood supply means that more oxygen can be taken away from the blood and more CO2 brought near the alveolus. Yeah? So it always keeps that steep concentration gradient. The idea that the diffusion pathway is small because alveoli have a thin wall. Yeah? Squamous epithelium is one cell thick and therefore it's a nice short diffusion path. And we know that the smaller the length of diffusion pathway, the greater the rate of diffusion because of this inversely proportional relationship. The idea that air is warmed because lungs are in the core of the body and we know that we have our body temperature of 37 degrees C. Now it says warmer air enables faster movement of gases. So in this case, they're saying that, so in this case, they're not really talking about like the, a, a change in temperature. They're just saying that because it's at 37 degrees C, the air is nice and warm. That means the particles are energized, meaning that they can move at high speeds. Yeah. Um, 
and then the reference to hemoglobin being able to carry the oxygen. So how is the oxygen actually carried away? The fact that hemoglobin binds to oxygen, and this means that the oxygen in the blood plasma is actually reduced, and therefore more O2 can go from the alveolus to the blood. Okay. But this is a very important six marker, and you can you could basically predict that they could ask this kind of question because it's it kind of ties everything together. This is a very good question to summarize everything. Okay, the mammalian lung is adapted for efficient gas exchange. Describe how each of the following features assists. Okay, right, so this should be very easy now. Lungs are composed of many alveoli, has a wall 0.1. Again, do you see why I, I emphasize we need to know that little table? Because micrometers, we wouldn't know it's micrometers unless we recognize this symbol mu here. So 0.1 micrometers thick. What does this do? It provides a large surface area because there's many of them and it's a short diffusion pathway because they're very thin. The alveoli are ventilated. Again, very, this should be like an easy dub for you now. You're just saying that O2 is brought in, CO2 is, uh, leaves. That means that there's a, it maintains a steep concentration gradient between the O2 in the alveolus and the O2 in the capillary, for example. Yeah, so it brings O2 to the exchange surface and remove CO2 from it and maintains this nice steep concentration gradient. Yeah, easy stuff. A dense network of capillaries. Again, this is to ensure the steep concentration gradient. We want to bring O2, sorry, bring O2 away from the alveolus and bring CO2, deoxidated blood, to the alveolus so that it can accept more O2. Yeah. So you've got large network of capillaries provides this large surface area for the movement of O2 and CO2. The movement of the blood uh, maintains the steep concentration gradient. We can say that capillaries have a thin wall because remember their endothelium is only one cell thick as well. And again, you could refer to hemoglobin being able to bind to oxygen, thus removing the concentration of oxygen in the blood and therefore um, more O2 can diffuse from the alveolus to the blood.